what's up and welcome to another episode of Evie's Review. On this week's episode, I'm going to talk about this video game from the early 80s called Moondust. Now, the reason I'm bringing this game up is not because of the experience I had with it as a kid, even though it was the only bright red cartridge in my collection. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I wanted to play it on the emulator, and guess what? No sound! The reason why I'm bringing this game up is because I wanted to set up a Commodore 64, and even though this game ran okay in the emulator as long as I set the video mode to PAL, it doesn't work in NTSC mode, and because I'm in the United States, my hardware runs on NTSC. So I put this game on the back burner for a while, but then I decided, hey, I want this game to have sound on the real machine. So what can I do? Well, it turns out Commodore 64 games can be quite easy to disassemble, especially if they don't use encryption, and especially if they don't use a lot of copy protection. Fortunately, this game has neither. So here's what I did. I popped open the cartridge image of Moondust, which I downloaded off the internet. Now how on earth am I going to find out why it doesn't have sound? So my first instinct, because I know that when you access the SID chip of the Commodore 64, it'll access addresses starting with D400. So I searched for all instances of D4 whatever in the code. And here's what I found. It turned out there were about six places in the code where it accessed these D4 registers. So one thing I tried was one by one to erase the references to the D4 and see if the PAL version still functioned. So finally I found this one place that seemed to be exhibiting a change in the behavior. So I did what's called a backtrace and I figured out where that call was coming from. So I discovered the main place where it seemed like it was configuring this thing called a raster line interrupt. Now here's how a raster line interrupt works. In America, the Commodore had 263 or 264 scan lines. Only 200 of those scan lines represent actual graphics on the screen. The ones outside of that range represent the border, and then outside of that, they represent what's called the vertical blank. By contrast, in Europe, there are 312 scan lines, quite a few more. So I was trying to figure out why Scanline 25 was running on the PAL version, but not on the NTSC version. And the only thing that I could guess was that 256 was getting added to the 25 when it shouldn't have been. On the PAL version, when you add 256 to 25, you get a number that's below 312, but above 264. Now, when I looked at why the author, who, by the way, is this guy called Jaron Lanier, why would he use Scanline 25? So it turns out on NTSC, the scan lines between 13 and 40 are all part of the vertical blank, so 25 is just about right in the middle. Now, here's where things get weird. There's a high bit for specifying the scan line that you want the interrupt to happen on. The program was getting the existing value of this register, changing some bits that actually weren't even related to the scan line interrupt position, and then writing it back out. Now, have you ever heard of RTFM? So, because I'd already done my homework, I learned that when you read this register, it tells you what the current scan line is. When you write this register, it sets what scan line will trigger the interrupt. So these are two different pieces of information. If you get the value, modify it, and then put that modified value back, you're making an assumption that the value you read is the same as the value that was last written. Now, here's the challenge. If I'm going to change the code, how am I going to alter the code so I can exhibit the intended behavior? My first patch idea was to just modify 25 and make it zero, which would have moved the interrupt to trigger at line 256, which is out of the normal area of the screen, but it actually resides on the border and not the vertical plane. So I was thinking that it might exhibit some strange artifacts. Not necessarily, but I really didn't want to modify the original behavior of the program. So after a little bit more searching, here's what I discovered. The code directly after the subroutine that I wanted to modify, it repeated the instruction of what's called loading the accumulator with an immediate value with the same value twice. And between those loads, 
nothing else was modifying the accumulator. So I realized there were these two bytes of an instruction that I could just remove. And two bytes was exactly what I needed to fix the earlier problem. So if I move this whole section of code down two bytes, I can place an instruction up here, and 7F. What that will do, it will clear out the high bit, the 8 bit, so that regardless of what it read from that register in the 8 bit, it won't pass it on when it rewrites it. And therefore, you'll never try to trigger the scanline interrupt from down here, which doesn't exist in NTSC. It will always trigger up here. So let me pop open my trusty emulator to see if my fix works. I hear something, what about you? Now, I'll admit, I was more excited about having done the fix than the actual audio that resulted, even though it is pretty cool. That's the thing about my experience of video games. I'm more excited about what I can do with them than just being a fan of sorts. And that's why there's lots more to come. And if you like this video, go ahead and click subscribe. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to tune in next week for the next episode of Evie's Review. Bye.